Hey folks, Winston for Carbide3D here. If you're looking for some inspiration in the shop or a gift idea, we recently rolled out a new edge light kit for making illuminated signs. With the included LED base and two sheets of acrylic, you can create some easy projects to spice up your desk or bookshelf or CNC. The kit is available now in the Carbide3D store. These are two examples I made and I'll run you through how I created them with Carbide Create and machine them using the Nomad 3 desktop CNC. This first variation was created from a vector I bought online for a buck fifty. It was made with a drag engraver because I wanted the corners of the design to be as sharp as possible. Here's how I prepared it in Carbide Create. After importing my vector of choice into Carbide Create's workspace, I set to work creating a boundary around the entire vector. This gives me a single vector I can target to cut out my piece and also serves as a cosmetic border around the area to be engraved. I selected the outermost closed loops of my vector design and applied an offset to the outside by 3 quarters of an inch. This offset vector smooths out the points in the design giving me a gentler profile I can cut around without having to worry about sharp corners and whether or not an end mill would be able to cut into them. But this border looks a little bit chunky so I'll offset it back inward by 5 eighths of an inch to create a more reasonable eighth inch margin around the design. You can see that this boundary that I created doesn't try to dip back into tight places like the area behind the ears of this wolf. The larger you make that initial offset, the more your perimeter will be smoothed out. To align this with some additional geometry I need to create, I'll align my design to the middle of the workpiece. I'll use the Move tool and locate it based on the geometric center of the vector. In an 8x8 canvas, the coordinates will be 4, 4. Now I need a neck for this piece, the part that will stick into the LED base in the kit. The LED base will accommodate pieces up to 2.8 inches wide or about 70 millimeters. I'll create a tall rectangle of that width and center it to my design. I want approximately 3 quarters of this rectangle to stick below my design. Then I can select both my outer profile and that rectangle and merge them using the boolean union command. That is my design portion done. In the toolpathing workspace, I'll start with a 2D contour toolpath. I think an eighth inch end mill like our 102 is a good fit for this application. If the ratio of the depth of your total cut to the diameter of your end mill is greater than about 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, chips and shavings are more likely to get stuck in that machined slot, which can rub against the workpiece, marring its surface, or in hard plastics like acrylic, this also puts you at a greater risk of melting the plastic, which would ruin your day and your workpiece. I'll be cutting about a quarter inch deep with an eighth inch cutter though, so I don't have any concerns about this happening. We're working on putting out some updated speeds and feeds for the Nomad 3, but a good rule of thumb that should work in the meantime is to take the presets for the Nomad 883 Pro, double the spindle RPM, increase the depth of cut by 25%, and increase the feed rate by 50%. In many cases, the Nomad 3 can outperform the Nomad 883 Pro by an even greater margin, but this is a safe place to start. Now onto the drag engraving toolpath. In the basic version of Carbide Create, these are the options you'll see. Pocketing is a perfectly fine way to flood a boundary with a toolpath to create a frosted look with a drag engraver. But sometimes the way a toolpath emanates from the center of a vector can leave an undesirable surface texture or pattern. In Carbide Create Pro, we added an engraved toolpath so you can get the most out of a drag engraver like the MC Etcher. It presents several options I'll go over in greater detail in a separate video, but the most important thing here is that you can choose a linear fill pattern that will raster your vector like an inkjet printer. This leaves a much more neutral surface texture that won't detract from the finish piece if you're making something that needs to hold up to closer inspection. Through trial and error, I settled on a step over of 0.005 inches and a depth of cut of 0.03 inches. I say depth of cut with air quotes because that's not how deep the engraving will be, just how much MC Etcher will be compressed. I'll start feed rates at 80 inches per minute in X and Y with a fairly aggressive plunge at 60 inches per minute. I'm only doing that because this is a spring-loaded tool, so that's safe, and there are going to be a lot of little up and down movements in the G-code. Let's head to the machine and see how this program works. Before I tape my sheet of stock down to the table, I want to establish my zero. I personally like referencing my table because it means I'll never go lower than this point. Regardless of any variations in my stock, I'll stop cutting before I hit the wasteboard. If I eyeball this so I just barely see a sliver of light under my end mill before I zero it out, I can avoid cutting into the double-sided tape I'm going to be using to hold my acrylic down. I'm also leaving the protective film on the bottom of my stock to minimize the possibility of getting scratches on my acrylic. Once I have my stock taped down, I'll jog the machine so that the X and Y zero are just inside the bounds of my stock. This is insurance against having part of my wolf head cut off because it was too close to the edge. Then I can load a tool, snap on my chip van, and let the Nomad work. 
The 8th inch end mill did a fine job, and even though everything went perfectly and at no point did a molten glob of plastic form on the end of the end mill, at the microscopic level we are still creating some heat in the cut every time this end mill slices through the acrylic. This means the acrylic will off-gas a faint plasticky odor. If this offends you, you should ensure that there's adequate ventilation in the room when you're machining this. I got really lucky here and I cut through the plastic without cutting through the protective film. This meant almost no adhesive residue got stuck to my cutter and smeared across the cut edge of the acrylic. Cleaning that up gets pretty annoying so I really like it when I get this right. After the wolf head was cut out, I swapped in the MC Etcher in a 120 degree flavor. If you're working on a machine with a bit setter or tool probe, make sure that the spring tension is set so that the tool probe will depress and trigger before the drag engraver compresses at all. And then it's just a matter of letting this run. The acrylic in this kit, and really acrylic in general, is rarely ever perfectly a quarter inch thick. The thickness tolerance on most plastics is massive, so my stock being a little thinner than I expected, combined with a little bit of unevenness from the distribution of tape under my stock, meant that I wasn't getting a good engraving in certain areas of my wolf. I re-exported the engraving toolpath with a deeper depth of cut to compress my drag engraver more, and that did the trick. From a couple feet away, this looks great. Up close, you can see some areas of the design are more frosted than others. This is a result of me stopping the program at one point and restarting. Not a big deal. Here is a second variation for an LED sign. Instead of drag engraving the design, if you have a vector that doesn't need the sharpest corners, you can mill away areas that you want to light up. Here's how I set that up. I started this design the same way I did my wolf vector, creating an offset border and stem for the workpiece. I want to use a 16th inch end mill to just barely pocket my design into the acrylic. That will provide a balance of detail since I can fit into the majority of the nooks and crannies of the design, and speed since this will be way faster than using a tiny end mill like a 132nd inch. But remembering that a safe ratio for cut depth versus cutter diameter, to provide some insurance against melting chips when I'm cutting the whole thing out, I'm going to pocket the outside of the perimeter of my piece. I'll do this by creating a second offset vector around everything and using a pocketing operation between these two outlines. This will take a little bit longer, but a few extra minutes of letting the CNC work is way better than a few extra minutes spent cleaning up or polishing the cut edges manually. To pocket out the main design, I'll be using the 16th inch end mill and I'm going to cut to just about 0.75 millimeters or about 0.03 inches. The settings I'm using here are 24,000 RPM, 90 inch per minute feed rates, a 0.015 inch depth per pass, and a 0.025 inch step over. You can't hide the tool marks from a spinning cutter like you can with a drag engraver, there will always be some swirl marks that you see in the surface that you machine. But combined with the small step over that I used, the resulting texture is super subtle and it almost adds to the finished piece. Also, pro tip, if you want the smooth side of the acrylic to face the viewer in the finished piece, make sure you mirror the design across the horizontal axis. The depth of the design here means that the edges catch the light from the LED base a bit more, adding contrast and making it pop visually. I really like this variation and I think it would be cool to leverage depth to a greater degree in future sign projects. There's so many ways you can go about making an edgelet sign, I hope this video gave you some ideas you can use. If you want to pick up all the parts to make something like what you saw in this video, you can check out the Edge Lighting Kit on the Carbide 3D Shop. Until next time, good luck and have fun machining, folks.